everyone. Welcome to the first Better Moments live webinar of 2021. Thank you for joining today. I hope you had a good start to the new year, a year that travel wise will hopefully be more adventurous than the last. Um, for those of you who are joining a Better Moments webinar for the very first time, let me brief, briefly introduce myself and explain how this webinar works. My name is Laura Graf and I'm the Marketing and Communications Manager of Better Moments and I will be tonight's host. As always, please feel free to use the chat tool to say hi to everyone and to tell us from where you're joining tonight. Because this webinar is um, taking place earlier than usual, I hope that some of our friends from the Asian and Australian regions are able to be here today. So yeah, please say hi in the, via the chat tool and um, let us know from where you're from. Another tool that I encourage you to use is the Q&A tool. Should any questions arise during the presentation, please ask them here and we will address them after the presentation. And you're of course welcome to also ask questions later during the Q&A session. But without further ado, let's welcome my guest or co-host, if you will, James Whistler Delano. James recently joined our team of Better Moments experts and we will be conducting photo workshops together in Asia in the future. The first one we are quite excited about as it will take place in the Philippines on the beautiful island of Palawan to be precise. And this is also the main topic of tonight and I will leave it to James to tell you more about this unique island and our adventurous workshop that we will do there, there together. So James, welcome and please go ahead. Thank you very much. Hi everybody, it's, it's a pleasure to join you and, uh, and share with you uh, photos of Asia and of uh, Palawan. Um, as way of introduction, um, I've lived in Japan for 27 years, um, originally from the state of California. And the first country I visited in Asia was the Philippines. So I have a very long history and a, a deep affection for the country. The, the culture is, is deep, uh, eccentric, wonderful, very, very traditional, and lots of layers. Um, I'll talk more about Palawan as we go on, but just as a by way of introduction, uh, Palawan is known as as perhaps the most pristine island in the Philippines. It's a long sliver of land running basically uh, northeast to southwest. Um, it has incredibly beautiful turquoise seas and some of the most forest uh, left, pristine forest in the Philippines, as well as uh, many other natural wonders, which uh, I'll share with you. Uh, I think probably the best thing to do is introduce myself through my work, uh, because I, I don't expect everyone to know me. Um, basically, I, I, again, visited Philippines, and I found an opportunity to move and live in Japan. Um, and by the time I moved to Japan in 1993. I wanna share with you uh, some of that early work, uh, just to give you an idea of the way I work. Uh, I would, I would quite, kind of characterize myself as a uh, street photographer, reportage photographer. I started out on the street and just by way of evolution uh, changed, uh, moved, migrated, if you will, into uh, reportage photography, and that's how I earn my living now. So what I'd like to do is, is share with you um, a screen of the, the, uh, some of my early work here in Japan on the street, just to get you an idea of, of what I look for. Okay, so I think, I think you can see that. Uh, Laura, I think we're doing okay. Had a little bit of a, a challenge before. All good, yes. This is, we're good, thanks. So um, Japan is a frenetic place. Uh, it, it's incredible that two countries could be so close together as, as the Philippines and, and Japan and be so different. And yet, if you live here for long enough, you start seeing how the, the uh, cultures kind of filter up and filter down. But Japan is a very, as you know, frenetic place, orderly, uh, high energy. These images were made in in Tokyo, where I live. And I would spend every waking moment trying to get out on the streets. It's quite eccentric. One of the hardest things to deal with with COVID is that I can't get out and get close to people like this. There's irony, there's 
comedy, there's drama. And over the, over the course of time, uh, particularly in Japan, I've, I've always tried to get close to people and photograph them uh, in an intimate sort of way. Uh, you've got a country full of very shy people, generally speaking, all crammed together. And there's a certain poetry and almost a dance that goes on in the streets. Uh, some of these photographs were made, for example, in a place called Shinjuku Station, which has kind of been my heartland for the last 27 years. It's the busiest station, train station in the world. And Japan being is an orderly society, and yet it's very chaotic at the same time. And, and uh, Shinjuku Station is just a conglomerate of stations that came together over time, but there's no real organization to it. And these are some of the wonderful, calamitous, chaotic uh, scenes that, I, that are basically my life here. This is my first department. And uh, Japan at that time was leaving the nation building post-World War II era and entering uh, a much better quality of life. But as a foreigner living on a budget, I was living back in that nation building era. And this is a typical Japanese kitchen. Uh, this was made actually in 1992, my first trip to Japan. And I could have made it yesterday. Uh, the, the poker face, the poise, the dignity, uh, dealing with incredibly crowded spaces with incredible grace. And likewise here. So I love Japan. I, I miss uh, being able to do this. We will, once again, someday be able to do that again, hopefully. Um, so let me uh, stop the share here, and I'm going to share some more work with you. I, I want to kind of run through this quickly. If you have any questions, uh, feel free on chat, and I'll, I'll see if I can fill in some, some details. I'm going to share another screen. Uh, after Japan, um, ironically, being from California, I, I felt that Japan was close, relatively speaking, but China seemed very far away. And in 1994, I went on the first, my first trip to China resulted in uh, my first book, Empire Impressions of China, which was published in English, French, and Italian. Uh, and it's, China seemed far away. And when I visited there, I was absolutely blown away. It's a, it's a completely different country today. Um, but the sights and sounds and the looks on the people's faces, uh, there's a very famous book, if you've ever, ever have a chance to see it, called Dis Farmer, about Americans at the turn of the 20th century. And I found that the, the looks on people's faces in China reminded me of the hungry hardworking for better future faces I would see in Americans 100, 100 years ago. So I, I felt an identi I could identify with where China was at because it reminded me of the photos of my grandfather's generation. This particular image is outside the uh, Beijing train station and these are migrants who come, came in and they had simply had no place to stay. I mean, what a courageous thing to do. And they came in looking for work. Of course, this is the uh, Great Wall. And at this point, for example, this is Shanghai, and uh, I see things now that no longer exist, relegated to history. Those boats are no longer in the Suzhou Creek, um, and only in the deep countryside where you see people gristled and tough like this. Now uh, people in Shanghai look like people in Tokyo or in Copenhagen. Um, this is Li Zhang uh, in the West, uh, the Nashi minority live there, it's a, they're related to Tibetan people. And now this is like a shopping mall. It's a highly touristic area. It is simply unbelievable to see the change uh, from what it was, but at that time it was a sleepy village. Suzhou, this is again a very rich uh, city now. But in uh, 1994, 95, uh, the canals were used. And this woman is, is re removing coal from a barge to use for uh, energy. 
it also gave the the misty polluted air but it was kind of like the uh if you're aware of the shan shui the water mountain paintings it had softened all the light these are the dong people who are related to thai and the uh, southwest west um, province of guizhou a performer in uh, uh, chinese opera caught him going in the door wuxing ting tea house and I, I think you can see why I was so attracted to China because it was a different world. It was a vital, hardworking, people sacrificing, willing to do anything for the families. So this is the uh, you know '90s around to, till around 2000, Xinjiang, way out in uh, the Turkic areas of Western China, different civilization. You see blonde-haired, blue-eyed people, Turkic people, uh, and of course horrible things happening there now with the concentration camps. Uh, this is one of t only two scallop sailed, ap you know, genuine sailing ships I saw in Asia. This one is in uh, Urhai Lake in Yunnan, and another was in uh, Halong Bay in Vietnam, but that was in 1995. So I felt so fortunate to, to witness this, and this is the uh, the Bai people. Again, there are another people who are minority who are related to Thai people. They are in Yunnan. And finally, this last one is a, a young woman asking for help for her education. And uh, it could be a form of punishment. They used to have criminals hold signs like this uh, reporting their crimes. She's just asking for education. Uh, she was there eight hours, uh, and this town is in the three gorges of the Yangtze River. And this actual spot is below meters and meters of water today. So again, I felt quite fortunate to have seen that. And I'm sharing these with you so that, that you can get an idea of my history. And I'll, I'll quickly move to um, follow on in a moment. Um, I'm going to open up a new window of kind of Pan-Asia work. As I said, I do want to, I want to move a little quickly so you can see this. Uh, honestly, when I see the three, uh, see uh, the um, Lord of the Rings, I feel like I have been to Mordor and I've been to some of these wonderful places in Tolkien's imagination. And that's what I love about Asia. And, and we'll encounter some of these, you know, uh, Gauguin, in the 21st century moments in, in Palawan. So this is uh, Gunung Merapi, biggest uh, uh, eruption in 500 years. And I was lucky enough to witness that. Um, this is uh, Myanmar or Burma, whichever you prefer to call it, British ferries they were still using. This is 1996, uh, first trip there. Kolkata in 1995. and what I love about Asia, and again, Philippines is like that, you can immerse yourself in another world. This is Cebu City in the, in the port uh, in the Philippines. And these are boys who were diving for coins and money that other Filipinos were throwing off the ferry. Uh, and they would dive in and try to uh, you know, earn, uh, get a little bit of money that way. Um, so this is 1992. And frankly, in many ways, it hasn't changed that much. Back to Myanmar and near, um, on the Irrawaddy River, uh, just beautiful Buddhist architecture and, and uh, the kind of poetry of the uh, culture there. Oops, sorry, back one. Kolkata again. Uh, I was surprised to find a few years ago that they still have uh, rickshaw walla, walla on foot. They have been talking for decades about getting rid of them uh, for various reasons, including, including humane reasons, but uh, it's an industry and I guess they see it as their way of making a living. This is 1995. Uh, Tibetan monks at the Mon Lam prayer festival, which is uh, around, uh, well, in a few weeks, around the Chinese New Year. Uh, in uh, what, what the Thai, Tibetans would call Amdo. This is not far from where uh, Dalai Lama was born. 
uh, but it's been cut off and placed in the Chinese province of Gansu. This is uh, when Tonli Sap floods some of the floating villages in a few months, this would be dry in the dry season. So a lot of these stories were, uh, first I would do travel stories uh, or choose an issue or a subject and publish it that way. Um, this is a uh, uh, Kawa Ijen volcano and they are sul uh, sulfur collectors. Uh, and this was, for example, a part of the same story as the erupting volcano before I did a story on <clears throat> Indonesian volcanoes. Um, Java, if, if Honshu in Japan has the most earthquakes, Java is the most seismically active place as far as volcanoes go I have ever seen anywhere. So I, I'm hoping also with this Palawan uh, workshop that I will be helping to plant seeds of interest in Asia uh, for all of you because it's affordable, the people are kind, uh, there is so much variety in Asia from the Himalaya to the rainforest, beautiful beaches, wonderful people. So, uh, you know, that that's to me what it's all about. Uh, another interest I, I do have in uh, Asia kind of evolving is with my Instagram feed, uh, I created a site called Everyday Climate Change, uh, where I have over 50 photographers now from all over the world realizing that as a group effort, uh, we can uh, do a lot more work um, locally, uh, you know, think globally, but act locally. Uh, so this is climate change work or environmental work I'll show you here, but also I'm always mindful of, of how it affect, can affect everyday climate change. Uh, I, I, I love the generosity of other photographers. So I'm going to share this screen with you uh, of global um, environmental work. For example, I'm going to pull this over just for that. This is Lago Popo, Lake Popo in Bolivia. It's at 3,800 meters. As you can see, it's dry. So in 2015, through drought, through glacial recession, and through water mismanagement, this lake that is 10 times the size of Lake Tahoe, probably five times bigger than Lake Geneva, dried up. It was a, a salt lake. Absolutely extraordinary. Likewise, just over the border in Peru, right on the border of Bolivia, this is a artisanal gold mine and the climate change aspect of this is that entire settlement you see there was covered by glaciers 30 years ago the old timers remember and miners 30,000 of them have followed the glacier up this is 5,000 meters incredible trash you can see there and the miners work in informal mines 30 days for no pay and then they work one day for pay and that one day better be good it's called the cacharero system so bolivia is an incredibly beautiful place um, but what water there is is often contaminated this is contaminated from a uh, uh, copper mine This is the end of the glacier at that uh, gold mine, which is called La Rinconada. And what you see are water hoses. They use those hoses to provide water to the community and for purifying gold. The problem is you use mercury for purifying gold. You vaporize the mercury from the gold it goes up in this air that's always near freezing, which immediately condenses on rooftops and on the glacier. And those are the two places people get water. So they're poisoning themselves uh, with 
the mercury they're using to purify gold. This is uh, Chacoltaya Glacier. That's La Paz in the background. And this glacier disappeared in 2009. You're looking at a, the, what used to be the highest uh, lodge to the highest ski area in the world. And it, as I said, the, the glacier, which was 18,000 years old, dry, uh, melted completely in 2009, which was six years before they expected it. Uh, this is back in La Rinconada, and the miners are mostly indigenous people, Aymara or uh, Quechua. Um, so it's the poorest of the poor who are driven to this work because of drier conditions and it's harder because of climate change to be herding llamas and alpaca. So now they end up in the mines. And when you enter La Rinconada, as um, it'll come up in a second, here it is. Um, you have to cross through a, a garbage patch in what should be the mo one of the most beautiful mountain vistas you could ever imagine. Uh, I tend to uh, love the beauty try to look past it, but uh, the contrast is inescapable. When the pandemic uh, hit, I was in Antarctica, much happier talking about this. This is uh, with glaciologists from the uh, Institute, uh, Chilean Institute, uh, Antarctic Institute, excuse me, or ENOCH. Uh, it would be the, uh, the way, uh, the acronym uh, that the Chilean government uses. This is aboard a ship. Uh, we were forced to evacuate this ship uh, because of the COVID crisis. They went into a state of emergency. Uh, so all outsiders, non-Navy were asked to leave. But you can see the beauty and the tempestuous nature of, of Antarctica. It reminds you every day that this is not a place for humans. Uh, the only plants, all life is tied to the sea. So the only terrestrial animals are seals, seabirds, penguins, of course, being seabirds, or the only plant life are mosses, lichen, and two uh, angiosperm plants, meaning seed-bearing plants. There's a type of grass, and apparently I did not see the latter, is a type of flowering plant. And that is it, the tundra of the... Arctic is uh, verdant compared to Antarctica. And this is a, a late summer storm in, uh, in the base. Russian helicopter pilot who brought us up to the glacier. I just thought he had a really cool face. Some of the staff, um, you know, they're dedicated professionals to getting people there. You have the logistics people of which she is, her name's uh, Donna. And she's wearing this full body suit because if you fall in the water at one degree centigrade, you'll uh, enter hypothermia in, in minutes, literally. This is, <clears throat> excuse me, Dr. Gino Casasa of Chile. He's a glaciologist studying, um, you know, the thinning of the glaciers. And actually this particular uh, glacier, Bellinghausen Dome, uh, is relatively stable, surprisingly, because um, temperatures are changing so much there. Um, this is a night trap set uh, to catch fish larvae, but what they found is they captured a lot of a, uh, a creature called salps. And when there are a lot of salps, they told me there's not much krill. And krill are the foundation of the marine ecosystem around the world. So that's kind of bad news. And salps uh, indicate the water is warming because the krill prefer colder water. So I learned a lot about the marine ecosystem on this trip. This is one of the grasses, the only grass that grows there. And this is simulating climate change by keep, keeping out Arctic winds. So you can see, uh, this is my journalist scientific side. Um, this is maybe more familiar to, to uh, Europeans out there. Not so far from Denmark. This is the Italian side of uh, Mont Blanc. And this is the Brenva Glacier, and it's collapsed. Um, frankly, it's amazing that there are glaciers left at all in the Alps. They're so awesome, but it is a Mediterranean climate. So the, the glaciers are really thinning quite quickly there. And a snowless March. This is 2019. 
So uh, we had the same thing here in Japan, although this year we swang back all the way the other way and we have a lot of snow. These are amazing men with Siguro uh, Montagna Siguro Fondazione Montagna Siguro, the secure mount, safe mountain foundation. And they're measuring the edge of the moraine to see movement, which might indicate uh, more melting in the glacier because of the walls of the moraine will collapse. Uh, traditional life, it's an uh, amazing mix of Alpine life and Italian culture. It's a, it's a wonderful, magical place. And more, more images of the, of the dairy I uh, documented. Uh, this is for a, an artist residency. This is apparently an arcane form of Brussels sprout known in the Middle Ages, and it's an endangered crop. And these young, youngish farmers are going back and resurrecting old species. This is a uh, pine cone grappa. This was, uh, if you're f familiar with Val d'Aosta, this uh, is the, the town of Gressonay. Quite a wonderful place, wonderful people. Uh, he's from the Fondazione Montagna Sicuro. And finally, this is, uh, we went up to, to photograph some glaciers above. This is on uh, Monte Rosa. So wonderful. Um, so let's get to Palawan. And I'd like to hear your questions. I, I'll, I'll talk about you know, some of the places that we, we plan to visit uh, and why I think that, you know, these are, are magical, nothing short of magical locations. So Palawan, again, in the Philippines, uh, known to Filipinos as, as their special island, uh, pristine coral reefs, karst limestone mountains. Uh, I, I've traveled, as I mentioned, for many years in the Philippines, and nowhere comes close to this, this place in my mind. It's, it's so special. So this is Bakuit Bay. It's on the uh, South China Sea side. We will go on both sides. We'll go on the uh, inland, uh, the leeward and the windward side of the island. Um, and there are just countless islands that people access on the on pump boats, or they call sometimes call them banca, the out outrigger boats. What I love also about the Philippines is the uh, Austronesian or the Malayo Polynesian culture uh, that spreads from Taiwan through the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, all the way to Easter Island in the uh, South Pacific. Of course, the Polynesians are Austronesian people and Madagascar. So pre-Columbus, these are the greatest navigators on the planet, bar none. And they are courageous. I've been in some crazy weather in those boats and they're quite stable. This is a Pearl Farm Jacques Brunelec, James, very fascinating quickly. man. We can't see yeah. your screen. Oh, okay. You can't see my screen? Oh. No. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. And Let's see. Wait a minute. Can you see it? Uh, nope. No, uh, no. Now it's coming up. Yeah, that looks. Yes. Good. Okay. So, okay. Gomenasai, as they say in Japanese. I'm sorry. Going back, these are the car. These are the Karst Islands. This is Bakuet Bay on the Sea of uh, South China Sea side. And I was describing to a, a blindly, sorry, these outrigger pump boats or banka. And uh, how, you know, you'll find these in, you know, Tahiti. Uh, you'll find them in uh, Bali. You'll find them in Madagascar. These are amazingly sta stable and beautiful boats. And there are so many of these islands in Bakuit Bay. It is, it is just enchanting. Um, this is the island that I mentioned to you, that Jacques uh, Branalek, uh raises genuine, naturally gold-colored pearls. He's a fascinating man. He was, he was actually, he lived in Tahiti, 
he was a, uh, an airline pilot, went to the Philippines and opened this business. And it's, it's kind of interesting to talk to him because he stresses how important it is to keep the sea pristine for the pearl business, but also he employs villages around the bay and encourages uh, ecologically friendly, sustainable practices so that this bay, which is on the other side of the island, not far from El Nido, El Nido and Bakuit Bay. Uh, and he has a resort called Flower Island, which is another island. So you take a boat to get here. It takes about uh, 25, 30 minutes on, by speedboat to arrive at this pearl processing center. And it's another 10 minutes to the bay where the, they have a beautiful resort called Flower Island Resort. This is... Uh, the subterranean caves um, and they may be the longest subterranean caves in the world with crystal clear water and a beautiful beach nearby. So <clears throat> it's a national park, St. Paul National Park. Uh, and it kind of blows you away because it's like being on a highway under uh, underwater, underground. It was too dark to photograph inside, but you had an idea of uh, the entrance to the cave. This is uh, back at El Nido and Bakuit Bay. So El Nido is the, is the town, famous town, and Bay is Bakuit Bay. This is a resort on one of the uh, private islands that uh, I stayed, uh, stayed at. This is Jacques Brunelec's Flower Island Resort. So you have these bungalows and the entire island to yourself, surrounded by a coral reef and crystal clear waters. It is completely idyllic. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful spot. And here are the golden pearls that his uh, 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 pearl farm creates. And it was interesting being from Japan, he, he described how he had a Japanese technician, I guess is the best word to say. And for years, the technician would obscure what he was doing to the pearls it was a secret Japanese process. And after he said four years, he finally got the guy to take the curtain down and show him what he was doing. I thought that was beautiful because Japanese can be very secret about what they do. So now he has that, that secret. Uh, this is just a local fisherman, the kind of people we'll meet. Extremely hospitable people, very friendly. Um, you know, you can go on a boat, you can uh, catch fish if you like cook them up uh, later. This is a uh, special uh, resort um, and I'll have to get back to you about the name but it's run by a Dutch man who's it's a kind of a, a uh, echo resort not too far from the subterranean caves uh, and this is the forest that you have on his property. This man is a uh, a uh, swallow's nest hunter. He'll go up into the caves inside this limestone karst um, uh, mountain, if you will. This is in Bakuit Bay. And these are the kind of things that you encounter when you are on a boat or you can, we can arrange photo opportunities. He literally climbs uh, you know, like a rock climber on this razor sharp uh, limestone. It's quite amazing. Uh, this is one of the many bays with crystal clear water it, it, uh, that are, you know, plentiful in Bakuit Bay. It's Tai Tai, uh, Tai Tai Bay. This would be the staging point to go to Flower Island. A uh, lovely place. It's a Spanish fort full of history, stories about how the Spaniards were battling at that time with uh, Muslim uh, locals. Uh, it was a part of a Muslim uh, sultanate uh, 500 years ago. Lots of history there. This is Jacques Brunelec's com commute to Manila by helicopter. Absolutely incredible. These are the kind of fish you'll see in the, in the uh, market in the Philippines. Colorful. This is near the uh, subterranean caves. So what I like to offer and I'm attracted to in the Philippines is this natural beauty, sense of adventure, 
uh, sense of history, uh, so many things for a photographer to dig your teeth into and, and photograph so many stories that, that there are to be had. So many, as you can see here, uh, shapes, textures, sinuous uh, rainforest trees. Uh, and we can talk about the rainforest ecosystem when we're there. I spent quite a bit of time in Borneo as well, a little bit further south, talking about how sensitive and, uh, you know, we, that's for another time, but it is it is a fascinating and important topic uh, for these times. This woman is a so-called Negrito woman uh, of the Batak uh, indigenous tribe. They were the original people who emigrated first uh, from Africa. The Austronesian people came, we're talking about 80, almost 100,000 years ago. Uh, the Austronesian, the Malayo-Polynesian people came out of China 6,000 years ago. So they were there a lot longer. And um, again, I can talk to you about, about that sort of culture. I, I've taken a particular interest in the, uh, the Negrito peoples who are uh, Australo-Papuan peoples. Uh, fascinating. Typical food here. Um, this is food for the uh, oysters, for the furls. Cultivation, it's a laboratory, of course. Uh, this is the kind of water we'll encounter. It's kind of like a still life, uh, just almost too beautiful to imagine. This is in Bakuid Bay. Um, they're, they're fishing uh, for squid. Um, and again, this is something that can be arranged. We can arrange to go out with fishermen at night. Uh, Depends on the season what they would be going for, but this again is how they catch squid in the early evening. Again, just give an idea. There's some of the nicest moments in Philippines are those quiet moments, and you find beauty when you least expect it. This is the man who um, uh, hunts for uh, swallow's nests and uh what a rock climber it's incredible i mean he's been doing it all his life and here are the birds nests that are so so valuable uh particularly in the chinese southeast asian chinese diaspora for soup and, and so on the beautiful forest of palawan this is where the batak live it's possible to visit them Pearl, dye, uh, pearl uh, processing. This kind of just gives you an idea of the, the beautiful landscape. This is near the uh, subterranean cave. Beautiful ocean as well. It's just, it's kind of hard to describe the colors. I hope that uh, this is a good indication. Of course, when you're there, it's gonna be more vibrant um, than any photograph can capture. And the kind of activities when we have a little bit of downtime, this is the ocean that faces, surrounds uh, Flower Island Resort, Jacques Brenelac's um, uh, resort. Some uh, down home Filipino culture with a carabao, water buffalo, traditional life, a traditional welcome. This is at the airport in El Nido. This is Jacques Brenelac. Um, and he was actually taking me, I was there on a story for Geo Magazine France uh, to show us a sustainable farm on one of the islands that he's, he's set up. And this is uh, uh, seaweed cultivation. The beautiful karst. He took us up in the helicopter, which was quite lucky. This is Flower Island, where the resort is. And from the air, the incredible natural beauty of uh, Palawan. The seas, the corals are incredibly beautiful. So I, I hope this gives you a bit of a, an idea of the terrain, the landscape, the colors, the, the beauty of the place. Um, 
I should probably open this up to questions if anybody has um, about the Philippines, what preparation, uh, you know, Philippines has a, a bit of a reputation, but Palawan is as safe as can be. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dream of taking anybody, any place that is less beautiful and less safe than this. It's just village life, nice people, good food, very peaceful, good place to reboot, recharge, if you will. And uh, yeah, wonderful. Laura, I may hand yeah. it back to you. That, that's the visuals I've got. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for, for the presentation, James. Uh, well, uh, well, I would go tomorrow if I could. <laughs> it looks so fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so to everyone uh, present right now, you're welcome to use the Q&A tool if you have questions, and I will forward them to James. Um, we have one so far from Marlene from Germany. Um, she's asking if you have any, uh, if you have photographed any stories on Palawan yourself. Well, what, what you saw was actually uh, from the story for Geo. Mm -hmm. um, so I, that, that was uh, Geo France uh, 2016. Uh, I did another story for Action Asia uh, as well from Palawan and I've published mm, too many stories to count from the Philippines from beautiful to rough and tumble. Uh, mm -hmm. I like it all too. Actually, I've been down south to the Bangsamoro area, the, the Muslim separatists in the south. So I, everything about the Philippines fascinates me and also the rice terraces up in Benaue, uh, mm -hmm. which are 2000 years old and incredibly beautiful mm -hmm. uh, so yeah can you tell us about one of the stories you you did on palawan what was it well, about? Th this was uh uh th this story was basically a, a journey through to offer the delights of, of palawan so what we we started out in a place called puerto princesa which is the regional capital we made our way up, spent some time with the Batak people, which again, I found fascinating because uh, I've been documenting uh, so-called uh, Negrito peoples for 25 years to, in the Philippines and Malaysia. Uh, then we made our way up and, and what I'm telling you basically about the pearl business is what I learned from Jacques Branale. Um, and uh, he, he would show us, and what I would like to do when we return there uh, is to take and make, you know, especially clear to Jacques that uh, to bring us to some of the villages and some of the um, eco, the green projects he's done that work on a community level, which mm -hmm. I think is so important. Uh, El Nido is on the other side of the island. It's about two hours away. Uh, it, again, it's just, it's simply breathtaking. Uh, see, uh, what we would do there, I would say, I would recommend is stay in a remote, you know, uh, hotel and take boats out during the day, arrange for fishermen to take us out. Mm -hmm. And so you can see how the local people make their sustenance in such an incredibly beautiful place. Mm -hmm. So I, I envision us doing a, a kind of circuitous loop, also including, so the Batak people including the subterranean uh, uh, caverns, which are uh, kind of like a, one of the wonders of the world, mm -hmm. uh, make our way up to both sides of El Nido, where uh, the pearl farm is, and also where the, the, uh, the Bakuit Bay is with hundreds of uh, karst mm -hmm. islands. It's, it, the light changes every minute, the sea looks different. So it's, uh, it's just for a photographer, there's never ending interest in, in what we can do. And we can, we can uh, modify based upon uh, the tastes of, mm -hmm. of, uh, of the participants. Yeah, that's certainly interesting. Um, yeah, I guess one of the, the most, most interesting places is certainly the Pearl Farm since it's situated on this private yeah. island. Um, so we have a question um, from Shelby. She's asking, 
my main question is this how do you approach people on the streets before you take their photo i have a hard time taking photos of people especially in different cultural situations because i'm not always sure how they will respond so this is a i mean this is an interesting question and it it, it varies country to country uh, if you had to choose one country to photograph people philippines is it and fr frankly you're gonna actually have people coming up to you and asking you to take their photo but let's let's pretend it's somebody who is shy and uh you don't know whether it's okay to photograph them or not i usually will if i don't have a common language it's quite easy non-verbally to say you know point to your camera smile and uh, you know kind of ask in, in a non-verbal way is it all right to take your photo mm -hmm. in the philippines i would i think the challenge is not can you photograph but can you get the person if say for example you wanted to have a non-smiling photo <laughs> that's probably the hardest thing to do in the philippines because everybody is always smiling so uh, the challenge, I think, for photographers, if you want to do a, a proper portrait, uh, is to spend a little bit of time with them, talk with people. Uh, a lot of people speak English, uh, which helps uh, with the international language. And to get them to forget about doing the, you know, chummy photos. And you'll also learn about things that way. And also people have a tendency what is the beauty of the Philippines is they have a tendency to invite you into their lives. Mm -hmm. And that, that's why it's one of my favorite countries on the planet because people are so incredible. And it doesn't matter if it's in a village on Palawan or if it's in a slum in Manila, mm -hmm. people are just very kind and very, it's a familial uh, culture. So I think getting, people to uh, uh, permit you to photograph them is, is not going, going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. But I always recommend talking to them and getting to know them because then you'll get a better photograph from them. Okay, thank you. Um, coming back to your photos from Japan and China, there's a question from Joseph from Canada. Uh, he's asking, are those black and white photos of Japan and China taken with film? Oh, now bear with me try x type where the graininess of <laughs> where the graininess of the photos intended to create a particular old time mood well i mean they are some of them are a little bit old um i for 35 years used a leica with a 35 millimeter lens only and um i didn't use tri x i used uh tmy a t max 400 I don't know why, but in the 80s when it came out, I started using it and I liked it. Um, and then I would use T-Max 3200. About five years ago, I switched over to digital for various reasons. But uh, so the grain just is what it is. It, it, it's, it was film. So it's not anything um, inserted digitally. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's all film. Okay. Thanks. Um, speaking about equipment, like what kind of equipment would you recommend to take to Palawan? Good question. I, I personally like to travel light. I mentioned that I used to use a Leica M, which is a small camera. And now I use a Sony, uh, it's RX1 R2, which is like the um, Alpha 7 series. It's quite lightweight. I like to move around. I like to be fast. Mm -hmm. I, I think that everybody's going to have different uh, equipment needs and desires, but, but I think if you can travel light, you're going to be better off. Um, you may want to bring a telephoto. I personally don't. Uh, I'm not as sure about drones if they're permitted, mm -hmm. but it's something to consider. Mm -hmm. yeah, but I generally carry a, a smaller camera and try to travel as light as possible. Tripod, a couple of lenses, things that you're comfortable with. And I also would suggest, because it's the Philippines and the tropics, to get a, um, I'm trying to think of a nicer way to call it, but photographers call them 
uh, excuse me, the camera condoms. They, they're just basically like plastic bags that go over a camera mm -hmm. for about less than 10 euro. And there's a little pull cord for the uh, lens. Mm -hmm. And they'll keep your camera, they'll save your camera and make it possible to work in rain because digital cameras don't like, and also salt water for the boat. Yeah. So I recommend some sort of camera protection that way. And they're quite cheap and you can get them at the uh, camera shop. Yeah. yeah. Traveling light is certainly a good point. I remember being on those little fishing boats in Asia and you don't want to bring too much luggage on those. <laughs> Absolutely yeah. not. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, what else? Um, well, I can just encourage you again to ask questions should you have any. Um, otherwise... I'll just, I just go ahead. Um, yeah, I guess what we can say is that compared compare to our other workshops, this one is certainly more unique and, and adventurous. Um, so. Yeah, and what, what I love to do is, is share with you, these things will come out with questions, mm -hmm. but having lived here for so long, um, I've lived two thirds of my adult life in Asia, mm -hmm. interestingly. Uh, I love the Philippines. I can talk about cultural connections. Mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned the uh, the uh, rice terraces of Banaue. They're the Ifugao people minority. But I will see parts of that culture bubble up to Japan. Mm -hmm. The Japanese won't see these connections, like the houses of Ifugao were used in Taiwan and Okinawa and Honshu, where Tokyo is, as rice storage houses. Mm -hmm. So there are these cultural connections between Japan, Taiwan, Indonesia, and uh, we can talk about them. We can talk about how the uh, Negrito peoples uh, can be found, how they influenced the uh, modern Filipino culture, how they came to be. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a depth of culture there that is amazing. Then we could just listen to Filipinos teach us more yeah. th about things we can't even imagine. So. Uh, to me, it is, I, I, I had, again, visited there first time in 1992. Mm -hmm. I thought I, from I was from California. I thought I loved Mexico, and I do. But I went to the Philippines and thought, oh, this is, this is different altogether. Mm -hmm. And I have been in love with it ever since. It was, yeah. it was love at first sight, and this fascination goes on to this day. Has it changed a lot over the decades? If it's been that long that you visited the first time? You know, I mean, for, I mentioned that China had changed un, almost to be unrecognizable. And, and it's a good thing. I mean, they have a great life. Philippines has maintained its traditional life quite well. It's evolved, of course. Mm -hmm. But um, it hasn't changed that much in, in some ways. It, mm -hmm. it, the good things are still there. Mm -hmm. So Palawan is not such a touristy destination yet. Still, we we can get a, there. Are, there are a few places, mm -hmm. but generally speaking, it's not completely spoiled by tourism, and particularly, for example, that Flower Island Resort. Um, you won't see other tourists except mm -hmm. for maybe on the island. There might be a family or two. Mm -hmm. It's it's just wonderful. It really is. That's good because we will spend a lot of time there during the workshop. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, exactly. Um, yeah, so there are actually no more questions. Um, is there anything okay. you would like to... Well, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us and um, letting me share this, this wonderful place. Uh, Philippines is pure magic, and uh, I hope we can, we can all meet there. That would be lovely, yes. I guess we're all looking forward to, <laughs> to getting out again. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so th building, thank you, Laura. We've been I really building up it. expectation over the past years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So thank you for tonight, James. Thank you for staying up so late. It's uh, well, what's the time in Japan right now? It must be twelve a.m. <laughs> uh, midnight. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but uh, it's a night place. Well, well, thank you so much, Laura. Really appreciate it, and I look forward to talking to Kristen and you in the future and meeting new people as well. Yeah. So for anyone who's interested in our Philippines workshop with James, it will take place in November, hopefully. 
uh, you can find more information about it on our website, bettermoments.com. You can also register there. And remember that we have a no risk policy, which means that you will receive a full refund on the workshop price if we have to cancel the trip due to coronavirus. So no risk for you there. And if you want to make sure that you won't miss out on our next webinar, subscribe to our newsletter. This can also easily be done on our website. And yeah, that's it from me and from us for tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you enjoyed our virtual trip to the Philippines and I hope to see you again for our next Better Moments webinar.